welcome everybody. I'm so delighted to host this series where we have an opportunity to talk to other folks who have worked in front of the camera professionally, because I know for most people in business and sales, this is the first time we've been on camera, at least in a professional role, and to just learn some of the secrets and tips and tricks of the trade and see how we can apply those to um, be more effective and more uh, engaging on camera. And today I am super excited about our guest. I have with us Joel Goldberg, and he has been a member of the Kansas City Royals broadcast TV team since 2008. And he serves as the host for all the pregame shows and the postgame shows on Fox Sports in Kansas City. Um, he's also won a Mid-American Emmy for his sports reporting from the University of Wisconsin, and he's covered multiple championship teams in Major League Baseball. I think I know which one that was, and uh, the NFL. And really interesting, Joel has built this 25-year career developing relationships with professional athletes, coaches, um, team managers, and now he shares those stories uh, across the world, uh, both live and virtually. He also has a wonderful podcast that I recommend you check out called Rounding the Bases, where he talks about um, leadership in these very interesting times we're in. And it's also a video uh, podcast now as well. So welcome, Joel. Thanks for joining me. I'm so happy to have you. How are you? I am doing well. Thanks for having me, Julie. And this is you know, this is so normal now, right? This, <laughs> this Zoom and virtual stuff. And, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I think, a lot of opportunity. And so it gives so many of us a chance to connect like this, whether it be via show or, or whether it just be a networking type of session. And I, I think it's good. Yes, it has opened some doors and closed some, unfortunately. Uh, so as we're, you know, baseball season's winding down and it's certainly been a tumultuous season. Is there a season that's ever been as dramatic as this one? No, I, I you know, I, when 9-11 happened, that mm. certainly shook the country, the world, and the sports world, too. But, you know, baseball took some days off and came back. Mm. And they came back, I think, when they felt the time was right and when it could help the country. And that wasn't the case for this. I mean, they really had to figure out, as I look back at it now, it seems like years ago, I mean, they had to figure out how to safely get players on the field. And then once they did get players safely on the field, it looked like they weren't going to be able to keep players on the field. I, I know that early on, and by early on, I mean, the season started late July. And I, I think it was probably early August where I was thinking, I, I'm going to end up having worked a couple of weeks and that's going to be it for the year. Mm -hmm. And somehow, some way they managed to figure it out with one of those overused expressions we've heard oftentimes an overabundance of caution, but it, I think it paid off. I, I, they probably made mistakes along the way, which almost derailed the whole season. So as we're talking right now to, to be somewhat early in a world series to me, seems like somewhat of a miracle. The, the uh, magnitude of the decisions they had to make and uh, all the logistics that had to go into it had to be just, crazy behind the scenes. Um, but what was it like for you being, you know, part of the team? Uh, you know, what was the energy like? We're, uh, you know, certainly didn't have the crowds to feed off of or the, the live interaction. Um, how did that affect you? And how did you overcome some of those challenges? Yeah, I think that the, the crowd part of it affected me. And I probably shouldn't speak for the other broadcasters. But I, it affected me less than it would the players. Mm -hmm. I, once I get in front of the camera, I could do my thing. And especially if there is a, you know, legitimate story or game to talk about, meaning the feel of say a spring training or an exhibition game or, or something like that just isn't the same. And, and you try to create the energy for that. But once a, a game is going on and it's sunk in that fans or no fans, these games were legitimate. They were real. They mattered. Then it was like, okay, let's go talk about it. So that part was easy to me. The challenging part, and this is very similar to, to anyone that might be watching in whatever profession they're in, is the lack of face-to-face -face contact 
with the people that enabled me to to do my job. And so I, I say all the time, and it took me a lot of years to figure this out, that as much as I love sports and this is a dream job and, and something that I wanted to do from the time I was a kid, I didn't understand until I got older that this business, first and foremost, is about relationships. And that's no different than almost every other profession. So if people give a compliment and say, hey, I, I love that interview you did, or you seem to have uh, you know, a better rapport with the players than others, well, that's really what I work on every single day. And now suddenly I found myself over the course of these nine or 10 weeks of a season, never face to face with one player and really having a couple of options, jump on these Zoom press conferences where everyone else in the media gets the same thing. And now suddenly, if I was the one guy that had these connections and these stories that no one else in town had because of the relationships, I'm getting what everybody else has that's popping up on every news station and every newspaper and on and on. And so I had to start getting creative with how can I, how can I stay in touch with these players beyond those Zoom calls and do it in a way that I'm not scaring them away because I couldn't see what they were doing. You know, is this a bad time right now? I can't walk into the locker room and, and, and read body language. So I think that was the biggest challenge where there were some days where my producer would say to me, because I do the in-game reports too, what do you got? And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know, mm. but, I'll but I'll find something. Right. And I always would, but <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times I'll walk into a locker room and I'll, I'll determine the stories that I'm going to try to track down based on who's available or who looks like they're not distracted, who looks like they're in the right frame of mind. And I had no, you know, I had no guidance on that this year. And so I had to kind of start just creating and throwing stuff out there and seeing what might stick and who might be available or whose parents could I talk to and just start trying to find other channels in terms of resources. Right. And that's a great example of just having to be more creative. creative. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, luckily you've established some of those relationships. And that's what I'm finding with with uh, salespeople and business people is the relationships that they had before, you know, they can build on that. It's, it's those new relationships that are really a little more challenging to create because you haven't had that in-person connection. So uh, you do have to get creative. And, and I think the key to that, and, and everyone in business knows this, it's those relationships from the past or those relationships that you started building in the past, hopefully they're not in the past. This was the time to leverage that. And not in a way of, can you help me? I mean, nobody nobody likes being sold to really ever. And there's obviously a right and a wrong way to do it. But there certainly was a stretch of April, May, June. I saw this as a speaker too, where people were dealing with their own stuff. And so if you start hitting them over the head, it wasn't the right time. However, all of those relationships that were built, and this is true for baseball for me too, if you just started checking in with people, seeing how they're doing, you know, what's going on, how's the family, or whatever it might be. And, and then if you needed a little bit of help with something and you could find the right way to do it. So I found that, you know, all those players that I had past relationships with, I was able to leverage into getting that content that I was talking about if I went about it the right way. The second part of that equation is saying, okay, what am I doing today that can help me tomorrow or down the road? Because we don't know when the next version of this is coming or whatever the next it is. And so you can't stop building those relationships or forming those relationships. And if we have to do them differently right now, then that's what we're going to do. So some of our newer and younger players, I did not get to know in their rookie year the way that I usually would. But I early on would find out, hey, can I connect can you get me your mom's number, your dad's number, brother's number, whatever it is, or coach's number, and start learning about them more that way since I couldn't sit down with them. And now suddenly you're kind of forming this relationship on the back end because guess what? When he goes back home in the off season and mom says, hey, he really said some great things about us. Uh, he really was helpful. Or he sent us pictures or a copy of this interview. And so, you, you know, you're, you're building relationships even though you're not face to face. I, I, that has to continue every single day. Mm, great point. And, and lots of application for business too. just, you know, 
networking and keeping, you know, mm -hmm. present, doing all those little things that seem yeah. like they're not directly leading towards uh, a sale or an interview, but absolutely valuable in getting you closer. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, so great. Uh, let's go back to early Joel Goldberg. I know you've been doing this for a long time, but uh, and I understand you always wanted to be in front of the camera. Is that? Yeah. And it's funny, Julie, because I don't know that I knew how to be in front of the camera. I just know I always wanted to be in front of the camera. I don't know what, I don't have any memories of, of anything that would suggest to me that, that cameras were in front of the camera is where I should be. And I very vividly remember the first time that I ever did some kind of on camera stand up in, in college. I mean, I, I had done plenty of stuff in front of, you know, like a camcorder and stuff like that with, with friends and messing around and trying to pretend like I was a newscaster. But I remember as a college intern at the university of Wisconsin going with, um, with the, the anchor reporter that I was working with, who's ended up being a mentor and to this day is a good friend. And, and I remember, you know, he did his report after the football game, you know, 78,000 people there and, and, and he does his report and then, and then I wanted to do mine and cause they were going to let me, you know, practice or get resume tape stuff or whatever. And I remember that he had to tell me, he's like, you know, you, you're not looking at the camera. Like I must've been looking down at the ground or I don't know what I was doing. Like, I had no idea how to do any of this. Right. So much of what, so much of what you talk with your clients about too, like, you know, until you get comfortable in front of a camera, it is a weird thing. So I don't remember, you know, working on that skill as a kid. I remember messing around. What I do know was I, I don't have any memories of a vision of wanting to be on radio or wanting to be a newspaper writer, even though I wrote plenty. It was always wanting to be on TV. Uh, I, I knew early on that I was not anything as an athlete. I mean, I was average if that. I just loved, I loved playing sports. I loved talking about them as much, if not more. And I knew that from either first or second grade. And the only reason why I remember that and why I can't remember which year is because my first grade teacher, Mrs. Dunwoody, moved up with us to second grade. And so I just know that either in first or second grade, there is a memory of me just bugging the heck out of her every day because I'd come into school in the morning and first thing in the morning and I'm, I'm going through the box scores and everything that happened in the game the night before and all of that. And I just always loved, even to this day, I love being the guy to tell everybody what happened. And that's changed obviously now because if, if, if something breaks right now, I can go tell my teenage son. And if I don't get to him in the first like half of a second, he's already seen it on his phone. The alerts already gone out. And, and so many people live with those alerts and those notifications, you know, secret here, the less of them you have, the more free your life is, but people find this stuff out like that. And so that gets back to the relationships. What can I do differently than everyone else? And now how can I bring that to people and be the one to bring that to people when no one else can? And so that's sort of, I view that as a, a huge responsibility and a privilege to, to say, okay, what, what can I do to add value to people from an entertainment standpoint, from an inter information standpoint, and how can I do it differently than everyone else? But that was the allure as a kid. I wanted to be the one to pass on the news, whether it was good or bad. Oh, oh my gosh, this tragedy happened. Oh my gosh, could you see, could do you believe what happened in that game last night? Did you see this? Did you see that? That's what I always love doing. And I guess all these years later, I still am. Well, how wonderful you were able to parlay that into a career yeah. and uh, your second grade class are their own personal sports announcers. So I guess so. How, how great for them. <laughs> Uh, so you, you get on camera and you don't quite know what to do. And uh, so early on, they just kind of put you in front of a camera. Is that right? Um, yeah. I, and, you know, and, and you're doing some of it in school classes. And but I mean, I'll, I'll say this, like and we were I, I don't know why I have that memory in college. It's not like I'd never been in front of a camera before, but I, I don't know that right? I ever it was. And I don't know that I'd ever done a. There were probably some nerves too, like uh, you know, here I am at at Camp Randall time. Stadium in Madison, Wisconsin, and I probably most of the crowd had already left too. But I think I'm standing in front of, you know, in front of my mentor and and wanting to get it right, and 
uh, oh, oh, by the way, his wife was the top news anchor at the station and she was standing there. So I got both like, you know, the top sports anchor, the top news anchor. And hey, uh, by the way, you need to look at the camera. And I, I, I probably knew that, but was too nervous or something like that. And so because, I, you know, even in high school, we had a we had a TV class. I don't think it was called journalism, but it was they, they taught you a lot of journalism. But it was sort of like this mix of going out into the community community and shooting and editing and producing stories that you may or may not be in front of the camera and then there was like also like this mix of almost variety show like i mean it, it aired on cable access and so there were these these um transitions or interludes or whatever you want to call them where there were little sketches in between so you could you could see me on camera with a few other classmates doing some weird christmas related sketch and then it's on to some story of interviewing whatever athlete or um i don't know and so, you know, there was some experience with that, but I don't know that I ever understood how to address a camera. And I don't know that you can understand it until you just do it over and over again. And mm -hmm. you start to get a comfort level to the point where you don't notice the camera is there. And that takes time. Right, right. Well, and like you said, even, you know, before you got on camera, you probably knew to look at the camera, but you get in a situation mm -hmm. where there's a little bit of nerves and you're trying to get a message across and you're connecting with the people and their faces here and the camera's there. Yes. Uh, and it just, unless you're practiced and prepared, it doesn't all come together and you can't really, uh, like you said, be natural and be comfortable in that environment. And I think that one of the other lessons to learn or keep in mind is the less distractions the easier it becomes to improve at this and we all have so many distractions but mm -hmm. i'll use the example for me on tv now uh, as someone that really doesn't ever get nervous or overwhelmed by by anything and that's just experience i mean if i've been doing this for 26 years now and I've been doing 13 years of every pre and post game show. I've done thousands of shows. This is no, like when some, somebody says, do you get nervous? I say, do you get nervous walking into your office? I mean, that's what this is. <laughs> I understand that it's a very different type of office. And I understand the allure and the interest for people. Anytime they walk by our set, which is out in the left field uh, at Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, and, and they all want to come by. And, you know, when it, in normal times, when it's not a pandemic, sometimes you actually feel like, you know, you're the... You're, you're the animal in the cage at the zoo because everybody's taking pictures and everybody's kind of peeping in. You got security, not a lot, but around because they don't want people running up on, you know, set live or or whatever. And and so it's, I understand that I'm living in this unique world and existence because it's so visible. Back to where I was going with this in terms of distraction and getting locked into that camera. For me, when it's extremely hot out, and they make us wear suits like up to 87, 88 degrees, whatever. I mean, that's, you know, I, we, look, we'd all rather just be in a t-shirt every day. And that's probably true in most places. Uh, but sure. now I'm worried and my focus goes to by sweating too much on camera. And so now my mind isn't on what am I going to say and my notes and the camera. It's every time we go to a graphic or to a piece of video or soundbite, I'm doing this. And I'm waiting for the second I could see out of the corner of my eye and the monitor, which is right here and trying not to have shifty eyes mm -hmm. um, because it's, it, that's awkward and uncomfortable for an audience or a person that you're having a conversation with. Um, although I think we have more grace right now yeah. um, during this okay. pandemic, but you start, that's where the mind goes. And so you start when it's cold out at the beginning of a season or, or late in the season. And now it's cold enough that you need gloves, but, now I can't operate the iPad and get the information that I need. And so your mind goes elsewhere. And so I bring that up because the less distractions you have in front of a camera, that includes a, a Zoom call or Microsoft Teams or whatever it is, the more you can focus on being comfortable in front of the camera, also engaged in the conversation because your mind is there. So those distractions may not be, it's too hot, it's too cold, whatever. It's It could be your phone, it could be you know, people coming in and out of the room. So I, I think one of the keys here is when you can eliminate as much as you can and control as much as you can, these conversations here become more, more normal and more natural the way you would be if you went to a coffee shop with someone. You know, that is so true. And I, I've noticed that myself that, uh, you know, and as a, as an, as an actor, if you never like put on your costume the first night and then, you know, 
walk around in it, like, because it feels you're not familiar with it. So you're thinking about why does this rub here? And what? so you never want to wear like a new shirt or something that, you That's know, so you know. interesting. I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off too, but that's yeah. so interesting to me because I never thought about that, but it makes 100% and the second it started coming out of your mouth, I got it within five seconds. It's the right, same exact right? thing. Like our new shoes, like now we're sitting, so it doesn't really matter, but but you, that's not where you try things out or, or yeah. have, you know, suddenly if I have a bracelet on that keeps clanging on, you know, I have to worry about hitting it on the on the desk and, you know, distracting. It's it's right, all those little things that take you out of the moment. And that's that's where you form these connections. So that's yeah. that's so powerful, absolutely. You know, you talked about, we talked about being comfortable and, um, you know, having a, but having a certain amount of energy. And I, I think a lot of people mistake that idea of being comfortable on camera as being really, you know, really, you know, I'm just going to be comfortable and be relaxed. I'm going to be kind of chill. I, I think that's not the right energy to bring, right? It's, that doesn't necessarily read well on camera. What, what is your take on energy and what do you strive for? It is different on camera. And I would say that there's this fine line be as a broadcaster. And I think as an, as an actor between energy and volume, mm -hmm. this, this, this balance between, I, I think that we, until we figure it out, we think when, when someone says have more energy, they get that bigger, means you get, get the louder. louder. Yes. Everything's right. bigger. And that's great until it sounds like you're shouting, unless you're supposed to be shouting. So how do you get more engaged? How do you bring more energy? And I will say, and I know you know this too, there's no quick fix to that. There's no, here's how you do it. Like, you know, here's the guide, go search on Google for it, or they, it's not there. It's another one very much like the camera where it comes over time in the same way that an executive who maybe doesn't love speaking in front of an audience, some do, some don't, and they may still dread it, but it gets a little bit easier and a little bit more comfortable over time. And it's the same thing with that energy. So, you know, for me, I think my energy goes up when I'm excited about the topic if I'm engaged in the topic. And this I think is advice that could work for anyone in this standpoint. I think if you're really listening to people, I mean, look, if you're talking to a dud, you're talking to a dud. But for the most part, hopefully you're being introduced to people for a reason. And you know who in your network puts you in front of the right people and the wrong people. And, and, and so when you meet good people, and again, I'll get back to, and you put aside the phone and you do, I mean, I just got a text in right now and I'll deal with it later. But when you can push aside those distractions and listen, then you're more engaged. When you're more engaged, you have more of an understanding and an interest in what's going on. When you have more of an interest in what's going on, you get excited about it in the way that if you were sitting down next to a friend at a coffee shop or a bar or a restaurant, and you sat, and, and I think about this a lot, and this this is a little bit of the energy that I'm trying to bring right now, even though I'm I'm not, it's not a, I don't have to think about, oh my gosh, I got to dial this up now for Julie. I, I it, It's natural, but the more we get into the topics of this discussion and they're topics that I'm passionate about and I'm excited about, then my energy is naturally going to go up. If you're not interested in the conversation, if it's boring or you're distracted and not engaged, then the energy is going to go down. And so that's where sort of that natural unforced energy is. I mean, no, no, if you sit down with a friend at a, at a bar and they say, Hey, I have this amazing news, you know, for you, my son just got into so-and-so school. I just got this new job. You're not gonna be like, Oh, that's good. <laughs> hopefully. Uh, right. And so hopefully, uh, you know, you're, wow, that's great. Tell me more about it. And to me, that's the challenge and, and where you want to fall with every one of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And they're not all going to be as interesting as others. But I think that's no different than you being on a stage. And now, is it real? Is it not real? I mean, 
maybe there's some differences there, but you want to make it as real as possible. And, and if you're really into it, it, it feels awfully real too. I'm right. There's nothing on stage that should be fake. It's a performance. And I don't, I'm not telling people in a zoom conversation to put on a performance, but I'm saying, get lost in the conversation, get, get engaged in that conversation. I think that creates its own energy. Yeah. I think for most people, like you said, I, I think it all starts internally with being very, you know, passionate about the conversation. And like you said, bringing that, that type of energy that you would with a friend, like, Hey, I can't wait to share this with you. And it's not phony. It's not, um, it's not mm -hmm. over the top, but finding that right level when you're in front of a camera, which adds this kind of additional pressure for a lot of people and yeah. art, artificiality is, uh, it, it is an art to find, like you said, that balance between way over the top. And I always tell people, you know, try over the top, see what that looks like. And so you know where, you know, what your range is and then find out what it feels like to be right in the middle of what's that sweet spot. And, you know, how do you get there? What's that feeling? What's happening in your body and your brain when you're in that sweet spot? And, and, and watch it back. I mean, record these, right. we all have a chance to record them now. And that that's painful. I know. I don't like to watch my own stuff back, but you and do I've been doing right? this for my whole life. Some, but I mean, well, I will say, not like I used to because the the volume of of how much I do is just it's too much. But okay. what I will say is this, that when I force myself every now and then to take a peek, and sometimes it's just, you know, there was this great interview, and I want to go back and take a look. And I find stuff all the time I hate. And so that's, you know, some of that's just being in your own head. But some of it is, oh, wait a minute, I'm doing that. You know, if you have good people around you, that they might notice some of that. Maybe they'll say something to you, but you, you know, you can't count on people to do that. They've got other stuff going on, and so suddenly you start seeing, boy, I, I look like, I, I look bored, or I look like I don't have enough energy, or I, I'm not looking in the right place, or my eyes are too shifty, or on and on and on. And you know, the only way to know that stuff is to look at it. And there, there's subtle little things too. But if you can, and I'll, I'll throw this one out there, because we all have bad habits. I know for me, there'll just be stretches where I lean on a word as a crutch and I don't even realize it, but I start hearing myself saying it over and over again. And it could take me a week when I'm on TV, you know, six, seven days a week during baseball. It could take me a week to get it out of my system, but I start putting it into my head. I start thinking about it in a good way, not a bad way. I might write it down on a sheet like, hey, don't forget. But if you start working on more than one of those at one time, it's going to be brain overload. So I think, you know, if, if you're watching your stuff back or you're thinking about it or you're saying, hey, I want to work on so-and-so, work on one thing. There's a reason why you do it over and over again. It's a habit. So agree with that. Absolutely. Because the, the uh, tendency is to go, oh my God, I look terrible and I have to change everything before I get on camera next time. And, and you don't. It's just... No, and you don't, and then you're not there for that conversation. So yeah. it's it's impossible. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, being live and, and interviewing people in the moment has to be, you know, like we talked about distractions, but um, sometimes I would imagine it doesn't always go perfectly as planned. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is there an example of a time that it maybe didn't go the way you had hoped and, and you had to recover? Because I, I think being live is probably a lot of, you know, pivoting and, you know, oh, yeah. what we're doing now it never goes as planned <laughs> never goes exactly as planned i should say right and, and you, you'll relate to that as as, as a longtime actress w what what show or production were you ever involved in where every single thing went exactly as planned it never does no and that's fine i mean I, I think that when you can get into the mindset of you know this is um it's fun to it's fun to deal with those challenges. I mean, you'd rather everything go perfectly, but when you get comfortable with reacting and rolling with it, and understanding that everything's going to be okay, it also it can calm your nerves. It can it can lower your stress level because you almost expect it, and not in a fearful "Oh my gosh, what's going to go wrong" type of way, but just in a um, you know in a hey, stuff's supposed to go wrong. You know, you have your occasional bad interview where you get the, the guys that give two words. You, you generally have an idea of who, who those guys are and try to avoid them. You, you, I've had 
Bobby Knight, the legendary basketball coach, once walk off in the middle of an interview because he didn't like a question I asked. And it's like, well, back to you guys. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what are you going to do? We have a number of celebrities that come back to Kansas City. They've been doing it 10 years. This would have been the 11th year um, that come back to from here. And they do a big charity fundraiser all weekend long. They raise millions of dollars for um, for um, Children's Hospital. And um, most notable, Paul Rudd, um, Eric Stone Street, Jason Sudeikis, uh, who am I missing? Rob Riggle. And uh, the first year, which was, I guess, 2010, maybe? Nine or 10, um, Will Ferrell came. And so... Um, and he, he did the one year. And so you'd love the, just the improv of it. And so I'm the one that gets to interview them and they'll give me, but basically the guys up in the booth, will just put their feet up and watch the interview and we don't call the action. And I just interview these guys for, you know, five, 10 minutes and anything, anything goes. And, you know, I just, I just try to, throw something out there and then let them do their magic because I'm not going to be able to compete and it goes into all kinds of weird places that you don't expect I mean it's just <laughs> you know like it, I mean it, it's it's like second city night at the improv type of stuff and that's one where you just sit there and say uh, this is there's no planning this I'm mean, not in control who, right who no I'm not in control but last uh last year I guess it would have been 2019 uh you know we're in this like dugout suite down by the field level and and it's wide and they've got a lot of guests in there too and so it's hard to hear and kind of line everybody up and so it's it's those four guys five uh david keckner who's everybody would recognize if you don't know his name he's been in everything um he he was with paul rudd uh and will ferrell and, and anchorman among others and so he got them all lined up and so it could be you know they, they've got a couple of microphones and i've got and it could be a little bit hard to hear and we came back from a commercial and i think i turned down to Eric Stone Street and said like hey you know pull the mic up closer or something like that and he didn't know that we were back yet because he was far enough away from the commercial and he dropped an f-bomb and the, we had we had actually I'm sorry we had started you know we were we were a couple minutes in but because he was all the way on the other end he was busy just you know chatting with Sudeikis or something like that and he didn't know we were on it and so I go to ask him a question and I hear my director said hey tell him to pull the mic up closer and so they hey can you and and he he dropped an f-bomb just messing around and had no idea we were on and that that was a really tough and awkward one he didn't mean it eric's a great guy but now suddenly i got producer in my ear saying wrap it up wrap it up wrap it up because they've got policies and and it was like we were three minutes in and this thing usually goes five ten fifteen minutes oh. and i just had to kind of awkwardly kill it and, uh, and then explain to him why I had to kill him. He didn't even know anything that had happened. So, you know, like that was actually one where I, I was pretty bummed out and felt bad. I sent him a message that night, like, hey. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, boy, are they ever going to let these guys come back again? But now he's a part owner of the Royals. So I, uh, <laughs> well, I think everything will be okay. Yeah, yeah, I think he's got a little leeway. That's awesome. I, so that, that was like, that was a more high profile one. But yeah, um, it, you know, stuff happens. Well, I think that acceptance that stuff is going to happen is, uh, you know, part yeah. of the process of dealing with it and just, you know, making the best of it and 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 adjusting on the fly. So before we wrap up, I, you know, in listening to your interviews and hearing you talk about interviewing players and celebrities, uh, you have such a nice way of asking people questions. And I know part of the job is really, as you said, listening, because you obviously have to be listening very closely to respond and ask the next question but tell me a little bit about your your questions because they're not just um so bob tell me about your background um yeah. there seems to be like you give some context or you make it very inviting to answer a question I mean, one i appreciate you noticing i mean that that i think i think that to me is probably right up there with the whole relationship thing you know like I, and i think it comes because of the relationships you build mm. i think that the more of a comfort level you have with the person you're interviewing or talking to and vice versa the more personal it becomes now it becomes easier to ask those questions so i think that's that's part of it it's one of the reasons 
why I really don't like a list uh, of mm. questions. I, I really don't like to, to script anything out. Um, I might write a bullet point down, a word down. That's how I do all my shows too. I, none of my, none of our pre and post game shows are scripted. Mm -hmm. And if they were in, everything we do is on site. We don't have a studio being in a, a smaller market. And that forced me. And I think that made me better with all of this because you can't be as scripted. You don't have a teleprompter. If they were to offer me a teleprompter next year, I'd say, I'd, I mean, I'd rather not. I really would rather not. I'd rather not be holden to that. And that, by the way, can lead to a little bit more rough around the edges stuff. I mean, I no one's ever going to hand me award, an award for being the smoothest, most polished guy. <laughs> but what but what they might say, and I think what you're getting getting at is that the, the questions are more engaging or more authentic. And so it's not as robotic. And it's just, and I may have a list of topics that I want to go to. And if anything, I'm putting them down because I don't want to, feel like when it's over oh god I, I can't believe I forgot to mm -hmm. you know I really wanted to ask about that one because my mind's not that good and part of that is because I'm busy listening and by the way I'm guilty too of mind drifts or you get distracted stuff I talked about before where you don't listen as much as you should and that's when the questions aren't aren't you know as as deep I think so I but I, I think the more you know someone the more you know about them and then the other part of it too is this, Julie, I, I think, and, and I would add this to my resume or uh, my you know, abilities that go deeper than anything like he's on TV or whatever, you know, relationship building I talked about. But the other, the other part is just reading people. And so my, my chemistry and my interaction with you and, and you're a high energy person is, is easy, even though we've only met, this is our second time meeting. You and I could do this on a regular basis, I'm sure. And I know that now, <laughs> but yeah, but, but, but that's not as easy. And you know, that with someone else. And if they're a lower energy or they don't have quite the same connection then you have to find that connection. And it, in some ways, I would say it's it's how to push people's buttons, and that probably has a negative connotation, but it's it's mm -hmm. meant in the best of ways. How do you how do you engage them? How do you have them more interested? Well, if they're more of a quiet, low key person, and you're banging them over the head with stuff, that's not going to work. And so maybe you have mm -hmm. to lower that tone a little bit, and you have to match them. I, I I think more than anything else, and this leads to the good questions and the answers is is what can you do as an interviewer? Or as a host or as a well, whatever an executive uh, on a zoom meeting what can you do to put the person on the other side at ease mm. and so when you're able to do that they hopefully in theory let their guard down as they let their guard down you get to know them a little bit better and that gets away from okay let's see next question here next question here and when you listen and you don't get stuck with a list. It drives me crazy when I hear an interviewer ask something, a question is answered, but the answer veers to other topics, which I do clearly in when I'm being interviewed, I go off on tangents and the, and the host or the interviewer says, yeah, well, um, we're gonna get to that one later. We'll get back to it. Like, well, but they went there now, so go there. <laughs> But it wasn't oh, next on your list. Yeah. And, and and sometimes I will say, sometimes you do have to go there later. From a TV standpoint, you have a graphic or some kind of production or a soundbite or whatever that that is mapped out for everybody that has to go later. I get that. But I, I just think, and how often all of us too, uh, sitting for coffee, wherever it is, how often is our mind sitting there thinking, okay, what am I going to ask next? Okay, what mm. else should we talk about? And I get it. You don't want to be caught you know, with your, your pants down, so to speak. But when you start thinking too much about that, you stop listening when you listen more. So when you talk about those questions, part of the reason why I don't have those questions is I'm not writing out. How does it feel to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what was the key to, which by the way is tough in terms of a post game baseball interview, because how much can you really talk about? Um, but I just think when you get a chance to know people better and shine that spotlight on them, it opens up a lot of avenues for conversation. 
Wow. So I was so actively listening. I didn't think of my next question. Just to so just... now you got caught. And you, <laughs> but ro you, and you right. roll and you roll with it. You but but you're it. right. And that's absolutely what happens in in business and in sales. And I see so many salespeople going through and they're asking the you know prospect these questions and they give them some nugget and they just go on to the next question. It's like, wait, stop, explore that. Like, uh, you know, you, you didn't hear that and because it wasn't and, next on their list. And I think it's okay to sit there and say, you know, I'll let people know if I'm in a conversation with them, even by Zoom and they keep seeing me looking down, I'll say, mm -hmm. so they don't feel like I'm being rude. Hey, I'm, I'm typing up notes as we're going. Yep. Hey, hey, that was really interesting what you just said. That was great. I just want to make sure I don't lose that. And I have terrible handwriting, so I'd rather be able to type it into a phone or, or into a CRM or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. I have it in my history and my notes. And I think it's okay to say that on the fly too. Hey, yes. let, wait, can you say that again? Hey, that that was amazing. Let me Let me jot that down again. And oh, by the way, I'm not saying anything here that most people don't know, but it's a heck of a reference point the next time you, you talk. How is so-and-so? Hey, how are you doing with that, you know, that project that you're working on? Hey, whatever ended up happening with your, your daughter and applying to that school? And so those are, you know, networking one-on-one -on -one type of things. But I think sometimes you need to let people know. And that's a way to slow things down in a conversation too. Hey, that was really interesting. Let me jot that down real quick because I don't want to lose that thought. But tell me more about that. Mm. I can dig a little bit deeper on things too. Yeah, that's a nice way to phrase it. And uh, yeah, it, agree because when and you're it, not- It also, uh, sorry, Julia, it, okay. it's before I lose the thought, it's also a way to buy yourself a little bit of more time for that next question. Like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I can't remember what I was going to say. Hey, can you tell me more about that? Because I'm really interested in that. And maybe you buy a little bit more time, but it also enables you to dig deeper. That's a good point. Absolutely. And I think that most people, when they're with someone that is- um, you know, they look up to, or they're in a potential business relationship, they feel rushed. And so they just boom, 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 instead of taking those moments to pause and understanding that if you're, if you ask engaging questions, then, you know, the other person isn't going to be going, you know, tick tock, buddy, let's go. Right. Just with every pause. Um, but as you said, I think, you know, if you don't tell people that you're taking notes, it just looks like you're looking at your phone every now and yes. again because you're expecting an important call. Yes. Yes. So, so Joe, this has been fantastic. And I, you know, my my last scripted question was <laughs> what uh, lessons have you learned as a broadcaster that would, you know, help us in sales and business? Uh, you've talked about a lot. So yeah. any last thoughts on uh, what we can take away, just what you've learned as a broadcaster that's maybe helped you? Uh, either in front of the camera or with relationships? I, I just think that it's, and this is across the board for everyone, Take one, take a genuine interest in people. It goes a long ways. It really does. And, and in part, because I think a lot of us set the bar so low because we have so many bad experiences. You wake up and you see, you know, a message on LinkedIn for a person that's selling you that you've never met before and they, they haven't even attempted and are not going to attempt to build a relationship and they're they're telling you what they can do for you without even knowing what you do and it's like oh, so there's so many people too? out there uh-huh <laughs> and there's so many people out there that set the bar low that it, it really goes a long way when you can be the person that comes in and takes genuine interest in someone it's like oh wow i i feel like sometimes same thing like you know tv personalities are stereotyped and sometimes for good reason but because there is this this expectation that it's going to be some big ego, you know, superstar type, then it's like, well, when you're a nice, genuine person, and by the way, there are plenty of us in TV, it's like, wow, he, that, it, 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 it couldn't be easier. Like they just, mm -hmm. they, have, it, they should have higher expectations, but they don't. So I think we all have so many bad experiences that when you can come in there and just be genuine and authentic and take an interest in someone, it goes a long ways. The other, the final piece I would say is when you can, and I alluded to this a little bit before, when, when what you do today is not about today, it's about tomorrow, tomorrow meaning anytime in the future. So from a sales standpoint, stop, have that conversation with somebody. And yeah, you know, I've got a friend that's in business development here in town and you wouldn't know who he works for or what he does 
until the second or third coffee. Mm. Cause he, and it's amazing. Now he's big picture stuff, but he'll say, I, I'm not going there to tell you about what I do. If you want to ask, I'll let you know. I, I'm coming to learn more about you. And maybe on the second or third time, I'll, I'll, if it makes sense, I'll start doing that. And so how many of us are selling in the moment? You know, it's in like the first I, 10 I, seconds. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, somebody reached out to me last week about a possible speech and we got on the phone and I, and I told her about, you know, what possible topics I could do. We talked about the date. Yes, I'm available. Uh, what's it going to cost? Here's what it's going to cost. Here are a couple of options. Let me send you some more information on it. And maybe I'll follow up in a couple of weeks, but they want me, they want me. If they don't, they don't. It's not going to be for a lack of, I'm not going to be pressing them on it. I'm not going to be selling them on it. They know what I'm about. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And so I think that if we, and that, you know, that's easier said than done when you're, when you're under the gun and if you need right. the money and all that, but when you, when you can have the freedom to say no, when you can have the freedom to not have to do something today, and that's what I learned in TV, put the camera aside, put the microphone aside and just get to know people. And, and my final thought here is that we had a, a, a player retire last month um, from the Royals and he had been here 14 years, his whole career with one team. His name's Alex Gordon. And, and I, I was with him longer than anyone and a highly respected and, and, and really successful career. And when he announced his retirement the Thursday before the final Sunday of the year, you know, we had all the Zoom stuff. And I reached out to 14 different people uh, that aren't on the team anymore, former coaches, players, executives, you, you name it, uh, that are all playing for other teams or retired. And 14 calls and 14 responses. Now, a lot of that was due to the extreme respect they had for him one of the better leaders of his time, but they didn't have to call me back. Mm. And they did because of everything that I had built in the past to go 14 for 14. And somebody said they heard a country music station on a radio station one morning talking about, could, was watching the Royals last night. And I can't believe all those interviews Joel got. And I don't even know who this person, I don't even know this person. And, you know, that's mm. a testament to, to, to the trust he has with these guys. That didn't happen on one day. That happened over time. And so I think about that business development friend of mine that says, just stop trying to sell and get to know people and, and the rest will fall into place. Wow, that's such great advice. And yes, it's hard to put that pressure aside yeah. that uh, you have or your manager puts on you, but so, so important because I think people can sense that urgency and they react defensively. Yeah, so that for doesn't, sure. doesn't work. But well, Joel, thank you so much. Um, this has been really uh great personally and professionally. And um, I highly recommend you check out Joel's podcast, video cast, Rounding the Bases. Um, you have some great interviews on there with a lot of different business leaders on his leadership tactics and um, just great conversations. So thank you. check it out. And thank you so much, Joel. And uh, we'll look forward to talking to you soon. We'll do it again. Thanks, Julie.